Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this public meeting of the New York City, New York City Retirement Board. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this public meeting of the New York City Rent Guidelines Board. This is just one meeting in a series of public meetings and hearings to determine renewal lease adjustments for rent-stabilized housing units in New York City with leases commencing or being renewed on or after October 1st, 2015 and on or before September 30th, 2016. Our chair, Rachel Godso, is unable to be here. As per the board's bylaws, Article 7.7, .7, she asked me to preside over this meeting. I will now take roll call. Please respond if present. Harvey Epstein. Present. Steve Flax, and I am the chair, obviously. Sheila Garcia. Here. Cecilia Hosa. Present. Kesa Bill Rahman. Present. Helen Schaub. Present. Scott Walsh. Present. Sarah Williams Willard. Here. And Sarah and Rachel Godso, as you know, is not available. The preliminary vote will take place this coming Wednesday, April 29th at the Cooney Graduate Center, 365 Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, starting at 6 p.m. Pre-registration to speak at the four public hearings will begin the day after the vote, April 30th, beginning at 9 a.m. You can sign up by calling the Rent Guidelines Board offices at 212-385-2934. For further information, see our website, nycrgb.org. There are copies of the most, uh, there are copies of the most, uh, most of the 215 meetings and hearing schedule in your folders, and copies of the schedule are here today as well. For the past several years, staff has prepared historical tables for the members of the RGB prior to the preliminary vote. These tables were distributed to the board prior to today's meeting, and copies, again, are in your folder. A response to the RGB data request to HPD from the March 12th meeting is also in your folder. A follow-up PIOC memo was produced by staff to address questions that were asked at our last meeting, and that, too, is in your folder. You also find your folder's pr proposed language for the apartment and hotel orders in anticipation for the vote on Wednesday. This language was emailed to the board members prior to this meeting. The New York City Division of Community Renewal, DHCR, will testify at our May 28th meeting. The questions presented to DHCR from 2014, along with their responses, were distributed to the board members at our last meeting, and a digital copy was emailed prior to that. Please let Andrew know if you have any additional questions that you would like to add by May 1st. There are a few submissions in your folder from the public regarding the guidelines this year. One was submitted by an owner of a rent-stabilized SRO, and the other is from a rent-stabilized tenant. Also, please note that the annual filing for the Conflict of Interest Board Financial Disclosure Report filing period has begun. The filing period will end May 1st, 2015. If you have completed your filing, please submit the signed receipt to the RGB. As you, know, as you know, today is the invited group testimony. Our first panel will represent rent-stabilized apartment tenants. And at this point, I'd like to introduce Barika Williams, the Deputy Director of Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, otherwise known as ANHD. Welcome, Barika. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you, everybody, for having me, and thank you to the tenant members for specifically inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, so, uh, my name is Barika Williams. I'm the deputy director at ANHD. ANHD is um, an umbrella organization with nearly 100 members in all five boroughs across the city, and our members are um, work primarily in affordable housing and increasingly in economic development as well. Um, and they are housing advocates, building operators, building Building owners, they construct, manage, um, and operate many affordable of the affordable housing buildings in New York City. Um, currently, our members have developed over 100,000 um, units of affordable housing in the past 25 years, and directly operate more than 30,000 buildings, providing housing for 100,000 residents. So, I want to emphasize that we are also coming at this sort of thinking about what is sound building development management and building operations, uh, in addition to sort of thinking about our tenants in our buildings who are our nonprofit owners really work hard to make sure that they support um, and encourage and sort of foster as a part of this process and that it's a balance. 
Um, so neighborhoods, of course, in New York City have seen significant rises in rents. Um, and we do recognize that these buildings incur costs um, and that these costs have to be accounted for and be thought of. Um, however, it's important to note that our nonprofit community development members have managed to keep their rents historically low um, by operating um, low with their operating expenses, running sound and safe buildings, but without burdening tenants um, throughout a long period of history. And they do this by accessing a number of different programs and tools. I'm going to click quickly do a snapshot of some of them. And if you guys have any questions, that's fine. Um, so some of the different programs that they that I'm going to list through and sort of talk through, uh, it's important to know that while I'm speaking from nonprofit organizations that use these, all of these are tools that are available to both nonprofit building owners and for-profit building owners. They are available to smaller buildings of less than 20 units. They're available to bigger buildings of more than 20 units, right? So these are tools that the city has put in place so that buildings can continue to be managed so that building owners can access things to make the changes that they need without having to pass on those big, big expenses to tenants. And so these are tools to say, you can sh make a shift in your building, you can make an adjustment, you can make a modernization, you can make a needed safety change without having to pass on a big bill to tenants year after year after year. Um, so just a few of those programs um, include the Article 8A loan program, which provides rehabilitation loans for upgrading the replacement of major building systems, um, the participatory loan program, which provides city capital or federal home funds combined with bank financing for participating in private lenders, for participating private lenders at 1%, interest for moderate and substantial rehabilitation of building systems, structural improvements, modernization, um, et cetera, and in building interiors. Um, the small building loan program Program. This is one specifically for the smaller building stock because sometimes I know it's been raised in the past that some of the small owners have felt like they were trying to sort of struggle to balance in a non in a building that doesn't cash flow with bigger with a bigger size units. Um, but there are programs specifically for small owners, um, which provides moderate moderate to gut rehabilitation um, for small buildings of one to twenty units, um, and the small owner repair program, which provides a ten year forgivable loan for limited system replacements um, and other repairs for owners of 3 to 20 units to address sort of like building-wide critical issues. Um, and then, of course, the J51 program, which provides either a 34-year or a 14-year um, tax um, exemption um, with the in from the increase in real estate taxes and a tax abatement um, that reduces existing real estate taxes either 8 and 3rd percent or 12 and a half percent of the CRC. So those are just some of the programs sort of in a snapshot. Um, and again, these are programs that are available for profit owners as well as nonprofit owners. These are for small homes, large homes, modernization, repair, rehab, um, building systems, right? So there's a lot of different tools there um, for building owners to then access to then be able to sort of balance these costs so that all of the costs each year are, aren't passed on to, uh, on to tenants. Um, the other piece is that the PIOC, of course, plays a key role in um, the Rent Guideline Board's evaluation of building costs and potential rent levels. Um, <coughs> NHD and I personally have testified multiple times over the years about serious concerns about how the PIOC is evaluated and measured, um, and that the PIOC has continually outpaced um, the RPIE, and how the increase of the PIOC over time is actually much greater than the actual um, um, income and expense study is sort of concluding. Um, in terms of numbers, what that looks like is from 1990 when we when the, this was first tracked to 2013, um, when the comparable data, when there's comparable data, the PIOC has risen 113, more than 113 percent, um, as compared to only 101 percent um, for the I and E. Um, this consists, this total is about 12 percent difference, and uh, over the 23-year period, um, which suggests that it's an average 5.4 percent growth for the PIOC as opposed to sort of an average 3.9% growth for the I and E. Um. And so I know that sometimes those numbers and the percentages just sort of seem like they float out there and they're not real and tangible. So thinking about what that really means and translates for a tenant's rent, um, if we started in 1990, and I just picked a number and said, you start with $600 in 1990, if we took the PIOC increase year after year, um, by 2013, a, a 
apartment would have had a rent of $1,680, um, as opposed to the INE, which would have increased only to 1503 um, or 1504. Um, so that's $175 difference in rent per month and more than $2,200 difference in rent over the year, right? So it's, well, these aren't the exact increases, obviously, that the board passes each single year, but the differences in how these numbers are calculated really does matter and really does add up to big changes for tenants and what and how they feel and, and how they have to absorb these costs. Um, we, NHD um, would like to applaud um, the RGB and the RGB staff um, this year for revising how the PIOC is calculated. Um, we've talked about this many times and we've advocated for this over the years. Um, and I know that these are complicated indicators to figure out and to get perfect and to they constantly need adjustment. Um, and, then, and I think as a result, we've seen a record low PIOC calculation um, this year because of the adjustment. However, there's also a lot of that is also probably due to fuel costs and, and not necessarily for the PIOC being exactly right. So of course there's, there's more work to be done. Um, but I would say that I would urge this board to also think about the fact that historically the PIOC has outpaced and so any conclusions and, and decisions by this board need to take into account those higher increases that have happened over the past 25 odd years um, and not just evaluate it as a static point in time. Um, which, right, the, while this year might be a better analysis, we have a history of more than 25 years of higher increases than necessarily needed based on the calculation of the INE. Um, I also say um, the other piece is to think about um, whether or how, whether or not the um, market decline um, is tracking up and, and down with the broader market. So one of the concerns is that um, there's the suggestion that the change in the owner's costs um, need to be matched by increase or increases to tenants. Um, but one of, the change, one of the challenges is really that that's about ensuring and guaranteeing a certain amount of profit and not necessarily ensuring stable building, um, build, so stable building finances. So while uh, when a building sees an unintended or projected increase in costs. Um, normally what has happened in the past is that there's a corresponding increase in rents to tenants. Um, and, and as I said previously, like a higher increase to tenants than what's normally calculated, what we would say is needs to be calculated by the I and E. However, when there's a decrease in cost or less cost than expected, we haven't seen a corresponding decrease in in prices to tenants, right? So tenants are seeing increases year after year after year. The operating expenses, some they fluctuate. They go back and forth. There's higher, there's lower. If there's a savings for the buildings, tenants have never historically gotten that savings back in their pocket, right? Um, and so that is a concern as well, is sort of that are we, whether or not we're guaranteeing profits for a building and ensuring that a certain profit level um, occurs within each building, or whether or not we're really making sure that we have, that buildings have enough to be sustained and safe and, man and well managed. Um, those are two slightly different things. Um, the other thing I would say is um, the, some of the preliminary 2014 HVS numbers are out, housing vacancy survey numbers, um, which suggest that actually rent burden um, in rent stabilized buildings is higher than rent burden in private non-regulated buildings. Um, non-regulated buildings, it's the numbers that the city reported come out to about 33% of income to rent, um, whereas in rent regulated buildings or rent stabilized buildings specifically, I think it was 37% um, with a median income of only $40,600. Um, and uh, another piece, this is sort of a more of a data side, but I also think it's important to know uh, uh, more and more of the HVS data will be rolling out as this board sort of um, goes through this deliberation process is that the that those numbers are being calculated differently this year. Um, and so there are many market rate units that are going to be analyzed as a part of that HVS data that really actually makes it difficult to sort of use it and compare it the same way that you would have and, and in 2011. Um, and so that's also a caution. So for example, in a um, 421A building that has 80% market and 20% affordable um, right now, 
all of those units are consider considered rent stabilized and all of those units would be captured in the data um, as they are calculating it for 2014 and forward, whereas previously only the 20% affordable units would have been calculated in the data. Um, and so there's, a, there's also a slight difference in how um, these numbers should potentially be used to evaluate what it means for building owners and for tenants. Um, so again, I'd like to say thank you um, for allowing me to testify, and thank you all for, for serving on the board. Thank you, Barika. Any questions from the board? Actually, I do. Um, for, I guess, has there ever been a survey of your sort of mission-driven membership on percentage increases uh, in the housing portfolio under your umbrella? Um, I don't. I don't believe so. Um, I think one of the things that we. I mean, we we sort of have conversations with them at each year to check in, and then regularly as they're sort of evaluating the buildings, as well as regular trainings and capacity building on how to manage these buildings, um, how to take advantage of these different programs. Um, one of the things that we regularly hear back from our nonprofit building managers is they keep their buildings as close to the bone as being financially sound as possible, right? So they don't want to put their buildings in a vulnerable position, but they also are very, very conscious about not taking unnecessary rent increases um, in any given year. Um, if they feel like the building is in a good and stable place, they know their tenants, they know that many tenants are operating on a fixed income, on a stagnant income, if not a declining income, right? And so there is this constant sort of analysis of, right, our, our building owners are sort of weighing the challenge of what is this increase going to potentially mean for any given family? Um, and they know their families in their building. And so um, while by numbers it might seem like a $75 increase per month is not a lot, you know, they, they know that Miss Jones is not going to get 75 more dollars from SS. Right. I mean, most of those have screen entry, but um, but the, they're sort of evaluating those things, right? And so they have said that they take oftentimes take as little of an increase as possible, um, and and try to while trying to maintain sound building. Sure. And just for a point of clarification, the legacy till CMP and the tax credit sort of portfolio are they considered part of the rent stabilized stock, or it depends? They're I, not no. correctly. <laughs> I mean, just depends, right? The the the, the tills aren't. CMP probably is not as well. CMP probably is not, but tax credit, tax credits maybe depending on the program. Yeah, it depends on the program. I mean, and this is where it gets it get um, if the if tax credits had some form of some form of city money or some city subsidy or had participated so in some D1 sort of program, then they, they would, would have been regulated. But if it's just a straight tax credit deal with nothing else in it, then it would not be run. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Sabil? Uh, it's on. That was on. You just turned no, it off. You just turned it off. Hey. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks very much. So, uh, I was wondering if you could say a little in a little bit more detail for, uh, from your earlier comments about the the way your buildings use some of the programs for um, for maintaining their operations. So, um, just to make sure I understand it, then is it is it your experience that by tapping those programs, the bil the buildings are able to maintain sort of a steady uh, op steady revenue in in terms of what's needed to main to keep up the building. Or is there other are there other sources of income, uh, either f kind of foundation side or, or you know what what are the other sources that you depend on to operate the building, if any? Because uh, I'm not as familiar with your model. So so I mean we have uh, over a hundred members, um, uh, member organizations, um, and they are located all across the city, and they range in size. So we have some members who operate relatively small building portfolios, and they've got 12 or 15 units, and then we've got other um, organizations that have 1,500 units in 
in their portfolio. So it's a big range um, in terms of who they are and, and sort of what they do. Many of the organizations are um, developers and building managers. Um, some of them at this point in time just do building management and they don't develop new buildings anymore. Um, and then some of them also manage buildings for other development organizations, right? So somebody else owns the building, but it's an affordable building and they ask a nonprofit to step in and do the building management side. Um, so it's, they have different pieces for each, right? There's different sort of different combinations of, of setups. Um, but in general, sort of the way that they look at using these programs is to say, okay, you've got operating expenses, you're collecting a certain amount of money in rent, um, and let's say that there needs, there's a big system-wide building plumbing repair that needs to happen. One model could be that the building manager pulls all of the money that they need to do that plumbing repair out of the reserves and then wants to replenish those reserves by taking a big rent increase from tenants um, and then folding that money back in to re-cushion the reserves, right? Um, but instead, our nonprofit managers and, and what we really encourage them to do, push them to do, and, and help them learn how to do is to say there are these programs that you can tap into, right? So as opposed to pulling all of that money out of your reserves and passing it on as an increase to tenants, there are programs set up so that you can then leverage that program. And maybe you still pull it out of your reserves timing-wise, but it means that the program helps you replenish that dollar amount as opposed to all of that dollar amount being passed on to tenants in excess rent. Now, they do the programs, I mean, I think one of the one of the things for nonprofit owners is they're mission-driven, right? And so they have this purpose of ensuring affordable housing for their tenants and for their neighborhoods and so as much as possible they are going to keep their rents low um, and keep their units affordable for their residents um, and so going through some of these <laughs> government programs just like right at all government programs take a little bit of extra work so is it as easy as passing on the cost to tenants no is it more complicated is there more paperwork is there possibly timing delays yes but part of all our push both for I mean what our developers have done and what a part of our what I would say the broader push sort of to the bigger set of rent stabilized apartment owners and managers is to say these programs are there and this is what they're intended for everybody to use right and so if there are more and more building managers operating in this way and utilizing these programs there's less need for a building to be managed by passing on all of those expenses to tenants and and is that uh just in terms of the like your balance sheet, is that is that sustainable? Like, what's what about other costs that are not in terms of investments in the building? But I mean, and, and so the the it, in, it's it's hard to do balance sheets in terms of theory, right? Um, but the I would say we 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 would not we don't advocate for for. Um, unstable balance sheets, right? Like it, it's actually, it's detrimental for us as a industry to have buildings that are not operating soundly. It's detrimental to the neighborhoods. We, the NHG does a lot of training and work to make sure that our members and the community more broadly know how to use these programs and run their buildings in a financially solvent way, right? So whether it's how to put a green, we just had a green boiler training or a, right? Um, so there's a number of different pieces that we do. Um, we, st I mean, we would still absolutely, we would discourage any building from pulling out a certain amount of their reserves, right? Because there are things that happen and things come up and, and you still need need to have just like savings for a personal household, you still need to have building savings, you still need to have an emergency fund, you still need to, and, and there are pieces in place for if something happened to a building and somehow you didn't have that. Um, but obviously, nobody, nonprofit, for profit, ever wants to end up in that situation, right? So um, we do want to absolutely, and we do, by and large, make sure that 
everybody's buildings are cash flow. Like when there's a, my, my colleague Moses Gates, like if somebody's having a concern or a question, that's what they do. They call and they say, this is where I am. This is what's going on. They talk between different nonprofit managers. This came up, right? There was a lot of work around this when it came to Sandy um, and Sandy rebuilding and recovery. We had many buildings in some of those areas. Um, but in, in I, I don't know if this is, is that a specific answer? Okay. Yeah, one additional question. Uh, do these buildings pay real estate taxes? Um, it depends. Um, well, because we, we have buildings that range a long period of time, um, starting back from the 1970s. Um, and so you have units, you have buildings that would have J51 and have reduced real estate taxes. You have buildings that have, um, there's, there's an, uh, then, then some buildings have come out of the sunset, so some of them ha are starting to in, like increase in their real estate tax prices. Some of them might be joint ventures, and so they, while they have a nonprofit manager, they're not necessarily nonprofit owned, and so they're taxed as if they weren't nonprofit owned. So it's a, it's a combination. In general, most of these nonprofit buildings or for-profit buildings in the city pretty consistently consistently across the board would all qualify for some real estate tax for at least 20 to 30 years time period, I would say. And is it HDFC for profit or not for profit? And HDFC is for profit? Okay, rental or co-op? Either. Because a, a rental HDFC is a non-profit HDFC and a HDFC co-op is a is a BCL HDFC a for profit co op. But they both can get tax abatements, like any for profit yeah. owner can get a tax abatement. And this the ten years is not insane. different for for profit or not for profit. No, I mean, I mean, the, the question is when the when the building is going through a program, what subsidy is available at the time, if any? But there, you can have nonprofit rental buildings that have no tax abatement at all, and you have nonprofit rental building payments with full tax abatements, like you can with for profit buildings. And and actually, this is sort of speaking of, um, maybe across both of your questions. I think one thing that is different and unique for nonprofit building managers. That that if anything makes this more complicated for them and therefore is more impressive that they manage to maintain these low rents is that their, their mission is consistent across all of their buildings that they operate. And so in a for-profit scenario, you might have a building that isn't cash flowing very well, but they've got five other buildings, one of which is 100% market. And in a crisis, you could draw on one of those buildings to cross-subsidize and sort of pull some cash flow temporarily or permanently into another building to allow it to operate. And that is incredibly difficult to do for non Profit developers and managers because they are operating all of their buildings at affordable rents, right? So there, there, there is not the the same fluidity of pulling money from different properties and different parcels to sort of help make the total overall um, company's balance sheets work. So that's another piece too. Sarah, yes. we can pass. Any other questions? Rika, thank you very much. At this point, I'd like to introduce Victor Box, Senior Housing Policy Analyst at the Community Service Society. Welcome, Victor. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present our concerns about the Thank you for the opportunity to present our concerns about the potential impact of rent guidelines on low-income New Yorkers. As you may know, uh, my organization, Community Service Society, CSS, seeks to improve conditions and opportunities for low-income New Yorkers. Uh, Tom Waters, my colleague, uh, regrets he was unable to be here this morning. Um, Last year, this board took a very important step in the right direction by passing relatively low guidelines for rent-stabilized renewal leases. Unfortunately, this step was not sufficient to repair the harm done by excessively high guidelines uh, increases in the recent past, as I think Barika 
indicated as well. Uh, this year, we believe the board should go further in correcting course and provide needed relief to tenants who have not yet truly recovered from the financial crisis and recession. Rent regulated apartments are still the largest uh, source of housing for New York's more than one million low-income households. As you can see from Table 1, roughly 336,000 uh, low-income tenants live in rent-stabilized housing. That excludes those who have Section 8 vouchers. Uh, another 84,000 uh, uh, voucher tenants also live in rent-stabilized uh, housing. Uh, since the 2008 economic crisis and recession, low-income tenants have been hard hit by excessive rent increases and stagnating incomes, resulting in damaging increases in rent burdens, the proportion of household income that goes toward paying rent. Uh, figure one on the following page shows how their incomes Rents, uh, incomes, and rent burdens have changed since 2007 using the most recent available data, the American Community Service, uh, American Community Survey, which does not distinguish, however, between rent stabilized uh, units uh, and other uh, dwelling units. Uh, Table 2 shows the underlying figures for the chart. If we look at all rents in New York City uh, uh, over the period since 2007 through 2013, which is the latest year for which we have systematic uh, microdata, uh, rents rose, median contract rents rose by approximately 28%. Uh, the one-year RGB increases rose over that period of time by 20 percent, while median household income of all renters rose by only 13 percent, and the median rent burden increased by 8 percent. Uh, that number seems low, but in fact it's a huge increase in rent burden, which tends to be fairly inertial. So um, these numbers make it clear that rents have been far outstripping incomes, resulting in rapidly rising rent burdens. They also show that the increases authorized by the RGB are a significant part of the problem. Uh, another survey, the New York City Housing and Vacancy Survey, enables us to focus directly on rent-stabilized tenants, but it is only on, uh, conducted once every three years, and the 2014 data has not yet been fully released. That is the micro data. However, uh, HPD has published some preliminary findings from the 2014 uh, survey. These findings do not include figures focusing on low-income rent-stabilized tenants, but they clearly show a worsening picture for the city's rent-stabilized sta tenants as a whole. From 2011 to 2014, the median rent for rent-stabilized apartments rose by 11.9%. Uh, roughly 6.3 percent above inflation. Incomes, on the other hand, rose by only 5 percent. This squeeze is also evident in the increased rent burden on the median stabilized tenant, which who went from paying uh, roughly 31.9 percent of income for rent in 2011 to 33.1 percent in 2014. Again, that's a very rapid escalation in rent burdens. We have presented in the past an analysis of the state of low-income renters in the previous HVS as of 2011 in past testimony before the RGB. Uh, and uh, although rent-stabilized tenants fared better over that period, 
from 2005 through 2011 in the uh, report indicated in the testimony. Uh, uh, although rent-stabilized tenants fared better than unregulated ones during and after the economic downturn, the guidelines enacted by this board failed to adequately protect them, even as they enabled landlords to enjoy increases in net operating income every year except for 2008, as shown in the RGB staff research. Our analysis of the HVS showed that from 2005 to 2011, unassisted low-income tenants in rent-regulated housing saw their standard of living decline by 7% after rent changes are taken into account. In other words, the inflation-adjusted income uh, minus inflation-adjusted rent per household member, what we call the residual income left after rent is paid per member of the household, decreased from 400, 402 a month in 2005 to 379 a month in 2011, leaving less left over after rent is paid for households, low-income households, to pay for other necessities. Uh, this was uh, uh, better than the 15% decline in purchasing power experienced by unregulated renters, but it can't be considered a fair outcome given that landlords' net operating income increased substantially during the same period. A similar pattern can be seen in the ACS data, which includes tenants in all types of housing. Uh, ACS does not distinguish rent stabilized from other renter, rentals. Figure two shows on the following page, shows the decrease in inflation adjusted residual income per capita since 2007. The plummeting of residual income uh, uh, has continued uh, since 2011, since the last HVS through 2013. Rent regulated tenants with income above twice the poverty threshold, which we at CSS would call middle income households, have also seen worsening rent burdens over that time. And of the 255,000 rent regulated tenants have incomes and level between two and four times poverty. This group includes the median rent regulated tenant. Figure three shows how rents for that group, incomes and rent burdens have changed, uh, including both regulated and unregulated tenant. And figure four shows the same information for renters of all income. In both cases, figures three and figures four, rents soared over the period from 2007 for middle income and all renters uh, uh, in comparison with median household income which remained relatively flat over the period and in comparison with median rent burden which remained, uh, 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 which increased substantially. Um, in light of these trends in rents and incomes, it would appear that private, the private rental industry has not suffered a decline as a result of the economic crisis, certainly not a decline comparable to the losses of income that continue to beset New York renters, particularly low-income tenants. Decisions of the Rent Guidelines Board prior to last year contributed to the growing rental affordability crisis since the recession. After the financial crisis, the PIOC sharply diverged for several years, exceeding the actual expenses of landlords, and this significantly exacerbated the problem. But the main problem 
has been the RGB's apparent policy during the Bloomberg years of authorizing increases that would be sufficient to hold net operating income constant without regard for the state of tenant incomes. Last year, RGB did break that pattern and voted for guidelines that began to correct for its previous tilt toward owners. This was an encouraging development, but it was not sufficient to restore the financial health of tenants harmed by the previous RGB increases. This year, fuel prices dropped sharply, while other prices measured in the PIOC rose modestly, justifying certainly a rent freeze, even without the need to correct past errors. Therefore, uh, the board should therefore continue to correct course by approving guidelines that include now a rollback, a reasonable rollback of rents. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Sarah. Thank you for this presentation. Um, can you tell me how your um, median contract rent is calculated? It's calculated. Uh, the ACS, the American Community Survey, and... Sorry, hold on a second. When I'm on a conference call and people hear the siren, <laughs> they say that's New York. You're in New York. That's <laughs> right. Uh, uh, both in the American Community Survey and the Housing and Vacancies Survey, uh, there is a contract, uh, there is a data field called contract rent, and of course that's the rent uh, contracted uh, without regard to additional uh, costs like uh, fuel and utilities. Um, the, uh, the gross rent is the figure that includes other related housing costs. Any other, any other questions? It does include Section 8, too, correct? 100% subsidy. Uh, the contract rent for Section 8 is, I believe, in the HV ACS doesn't, doesn't look at Section 8 vouchers. Uh, the HVS does, and it includes the, the rent paid to the owner as the contract rent. Okay. That's why we put Section 8 households, the voucher households, in a separate category from uh, what we call rent-regulated tenants. Tenants. They're included in the public subsidized or voucher tenant group. Harvey. Thank you, Vic. Um, I, I guess for either you or Barika, I mean, we're going to continue to hear that I think from owners that their, their operating expenses are more than a rollback would suggest that it'll hurt them or that a rent freeze will hurt owners in this city in New York. How do you respond to those claims that they'll either a rollback or a freeze will result in traumatic incidents in the real estate market in New York? Well, uh, that certainly hasn't been the case in past years. Uh, net operating income has increased uh, steadily. As, as you can see from the charts, rents has soared well above uh, uh, household incomes and the like. Uh, it's hard to imagine in this tight, high-cost market uh, in which uh, rent is still escalating, from what I understand, and certainly from uh, the recent HVS figures, that owners are going to suffer as a result of a freeze or even a rollback. I, I, Harvey, I, I think to that question, I, I think I would ask whether, I, I think I would say whether or not a any action taken by this board, a freeze or rollback, is whether there's a there's a difference between something being traumatic and then something being different than what has been done before, right? And so many tenants have been going through a very traumatic process for years of increases year after year after year um, on their rent and having to figure out how it works for their households. Um, is it possible to do something that could be traumatic to a building's operations? Absolutely, right? Sandy was traumatic to many buildings' operations. But I think there's a difference between taking an action um, that changes the balance of an equation um, and potentially says, you know, based on this year and years previous, right, because this is a single year's action, but it's connected 
attested to multiple years of action over time um, as to whether or not an, a single year is actually a traumatic act. Right? Could, is something that the board does just this year enough for a building to be in complete disrepair next year? Or is something that the board does this year saying we are looking at what has happened historically, we're looking at where things are right now, we're making this decision to sort of put things in perspective. Um, and yes, it's a change, and yes, it's going to be different, and yes, it will be an adjustment for building owners, but a, a change in numbers is different than a traumatic event in terms of finances. Can I just ask, uh, I know in Westchester and Nassau County, they both had rent freezes in over the last four to five years. Can you talk about those experiences and ha how that had any, what the impact was on those real estate markets? Uh, I, I'm unable to, sorry. I mean, I know that Westchester has had, um, I think, two rent freezes in, I think, the past 10 years. And part of this has been um, a big criticism that we've had over a long period of time about how the Pi Act has been calculated here in New York City, right? especially thinking about the fact that New York City is in the same MSA as Westchester. And so many of our affordable housing numbers are being calculated all together. So our median, our, our AMI, our area median income is calculated with Westchester, our FMR, our fair market rent is count, uh, calculated with Westchester. And so for surrounding counties to be looking at their operating expenses and their costs um, and to be coming up with vastly different conclusions than what is happening here in New York City um, is very challenging. And it's largely been, I, I think one of the differences is that there is an understanding in their real estate market that their changes in rents um, fluctuate, right? And sometimes it can be nothing and sometimes it can be a little and, and building managers operate accordingly um, and they don't bank on some sort of increase every single year, whereas I think the history in New York City has been there is always something and so oper building operators bank on there always being something and and so I, I, I think that's sort of a, it's, it, spreadsheets are going to need to change and spreadsheets can change, that's not the end of the world, right? Any other questions, comments? On that note, I want to thank you both very much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.